<laughs> and we are live. Hello, everyone. I am, as my voice most likely suggests, I am still sick with COVID, uh, COVID slash Omicron, whichever it is. Uh, the last live stream that we did was on December 6th, uh, no, December 26th. Um, so that was, I think, five, six days ago. Um, that, that's how sick I was. My original plan couldn't work. The original plan of doing daily live stream until uh, live streaming until uh, today um, didn't work because I, I was just too sick to do it. Um, but I'm here now uh, to wish you all a happy new year, happy 2022. And uh, for today, I thought maybe we could do something fun. Uh, something fun and lighthearted. Hi, Tyson. Good to see you. Uh, good to read, hear from you as well. Um, so for uh, this video, I thought we could do something lighthearted and fun. Just uh, point to 22 books for this year that we could spend time with you know, hopefully these will not be the only books that I read, uh, but they are some of the books that I, I would like to uh, to read. So let's begin with the book that I'm reading these days. Uh, this book that I'm going to, to show you now, it, it provided me with a lot of comfort during my sick days. Uh, it's one of those books that for me, being in bed, being relatively immobile, uh, unable to do almost uh, anything. Reading is, uh, you know, I couldn't read uh, every day, but I started to, part of my recovery, part of knowing that I'm recovering was knowing that I'm able to get back to reading. And the book that I was reading was Don Quixote by Miguel de Cervantes. It is um, remarkable... I mean, I can't, I can't really praise this book. Um, it is, uh, it seems like it is out of this world. It's from somewhere else, and um, it is a book that justifies not only the reading of this book, but the reading of books in general, the reading of novels. I think this is one of those books that justifies the idea of a novel. Uh, the novel it, as, a, as a form of art, as a form of writing. Um, so, number one. And I will be happy to just spend the whole year with this book. <laughs> just reading and rereading it. Uh, then, the second book is one that was heavily influenced, an author that was heavily influenced by Cervantes, and this book is a, almost like an homage to Cervantes. And it is a book by Denis Diderot. Uh, it's called Jacques the Fatalist. Jacques the Fatalist. Uh, it involves a character and his master. Um, and then, okay, after this... My motivation to read this was to read my favorite authors, one of my favorite authors, uh, a variation on that theme, um, Jacques and his Master by Milan Kondera, which is a direct um, tribute to Diderot. So this is a play by Milan Kondera. It's a short read. Mm -hmm. And it is, he is uh, in part um, a kind of, uh, he performs his belonging to the tradition that began with Cervantes and embodied also among other people by Denis Diderot. So that is his, uh, his, like with a lot of pleasure, he is announcing his belonging to that line of, that line of work, that literary line, lineage. And since I know after reading this very short, too short, 
work by Condera. I want to read more. Um, my plan is to read this book by him, this novel, Life is Elsewhere. It's one of the books that I haven't read by him. Life is Elsewhere by Milan Kundera. Let's not keep, uh, let's not lose uh, track of the numbers. Life is Elsewhere is our number four. So four out of 22. Then we get to this big chunk of books that I received from publishers and I need to review. So let's go through them. Art Can Help by Robert Adam. Adams, sorry. Um, Touch by Richard Carney. Metropolis by Ben Wilson, A History of the City. And those uh, three books that I just went through, I don't know enough of them to, uh, to recommend. But the next book I've read, I've read, I think, 70% of it, 70% of this uh, Emancipation After Hegel, great book inspired by Hegel, uh, written by Todd McGowan. Um, I really enjoyed it, but it was a little bit heavy for me, and I lost uh, fuel, uh, and I didn't reach the end. And now I probably, I would like to go to the beginning and start over, because it's just so enjoyable. And McGowan's style of writing, and it's very down to earth, and he doesn't claim to give us a very, a very accurate uh, representation of Hegel. He's doing his own thing, but um, he's just, he tries to state precisely in what way he is inspired, um, and he finds Hegel useful. So, eman Emancipation after Hegel, I would recommend this one. Um, another book by Todd McGowan, Universality and Identity Politics. It's a quite relevant topic. Um, and then inside the critics circle, uh, this is, this reads, to be honest, inside the critics circle by Philippa Chong. It reads like a master, something between a master's thesis and a PhD thesis. Um, it is based on interviews with editors and book critics, book reviewers, uh, based on about 40 interviews. So you might, one reason to be interested in a book like this is if you're interested in doing a kind of research like that, uh, interview-based research. Uh, yes, yes. I would be totally up for it, Tyson. Uh, especially the his own, when it comes to his own ideas, um, like the Identity Politics book. So this book, um, it, it reads like a dissertation uh, because it's a bit dry, um, but it, I find it quite interesting. It, it talks about the, all the contingent factors in the business of reviewing, reviewing books, like who the editors know, how the editors pair a book that is supposed to be reviewed uh, with a pair that book with a reviewer. How do they select a book? Um, how do they choose to dismiss a book? You know, if two books from in, in the same genre arrive at the reviewer's uh, or editor's desk, one of them might be dismissed just because uh, the editor doesn't want to review two similar books or two books belonging to the same genre in the same issue um, of their period, periodical or magazine. So this is, uh, as, as I said, it, based on interviews, detailed interviews, it's uh, conducted, the research is conducted well. And um, I also find it kind of interesting, but a bit forced that the whole book is framed in terms of the uncertainty of these times where book reviewers don't have you know, professional certainties and security and so forth. Um, and uh, the author plays with that theme of uncertainty um, going beyond the, the interview material. I'll do a, a whole a review of this book because I, I found it engaging enough. And I've enjoyed it so far. And the Art of Self-Improvement, 10 uh, Timeless Truths. I'm 
I'm pretty sure I'll regret requesting this <laughs> for review, but it's okay. Live and learn. Um, I mean, that's the that's the worst scenario. I will say, live and learn when I'm reviewing that book. How to Be Animal by Melanie Challenger. I've heard a lot of good things about this book. I look forward to reading this. Uh, a book, um, a critical uh, book about science, discourse uh, about science, how people, what people do with science, what kind of non-scientific things uh, people do with scientific objects, like um, a brain image, an image of a brain. When we have an image of a brain in our hand uh, on a paper, what does that, what, what kind of license that can turn into? What kind of speech does that allow? You know, oh, look at that. It's like there's activity in the brain here. You know, what does that mean? And I see uh, one of the comments in the first video that I showed this, uh, the commenter pointed out that these are, uh, I think it was Mike, yeah. Uh, Mike Glademans. There are six identical uh, images of a brain, pet, pet images of a brain here, and the labels are different. Anthropologists, normal, depressed, um, caffeinated, scientists, awake. You know, so that act of giving label um, is significant. Okay, uh, A Thousand Years of Nonlinear History is an intimidating book for me, uh, but I would like to get into it at some point this year. By Manuel de Landa. Um, picture in person, by the way, was by uh, Joseph Dummett. See, I'm, I still have um, COVID brain. <laughs> the foggy brain. It, I don't, I forget to uh, say the author's name. Salman Rushdie. Languages of Truth, Essays. Okay, so that gets us to 15. And then I have the more serious books that I would like to read and continue to read. And I would really, I, I like to recommend these books to my viewers because um, sometimes we just need a quick reference to Freud or a quick reference to to Jung, or and it, and it would be really tremendous, <laughs> tremendous. I, that that word doesn't sound normal coming out of my mouth. Um, it sounds funny. <clears throat> it would be very good. It, it would be a good thing, tremendous thing, if we have a shared background such that we can just make a quick reference to Freud or another person, Ernesto Laclau. Um, talking about empty signifiers or floating signifiers uh, or the way Laclau discussed populist as a logic, not as a type of movement. So I would like to spend more time with this book, even though we spent uh, with my Patreon reading group, the, th the theory reading group and discussion group, we spent a few months going through this um, six chapters of this book, but I, I would like to continue. Um, this is a valuable book with insights that generalize beyond um, psychology. Uh, I want to say the book is not restricted to either psychology or politics or psychoanalysis. It's the merit of a book like this is precisely in its, the, the, its way of connecting those different areas um, and really presenting a field like the interdisciplinary field like political psychology or political psychoanalysis as a legitimate and a very interesting field of, of thinking and working. So Ernesto Laclau on populist reason. Um, these are the books that I would recommend by, uh, I mean, for reading Freud, The Penguin, a Freud Reader, uh, great translations. Um, it's, I really like the title, Drives and Their Fate. You know, that's so, so much nicer to read than you know, something like um, Instincts and Their Vicissitudes. 
um, and Adam Phillips uh, selected and edited them. Um, for Jung, I would go spend more time with the, the essential Jung. And then uh, another plan for this year, hopefully a collective plan, is to spend some time with the critique of uh, Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant. Now, it took me really a, a long time to appreciate Kant. Um, let me read Tyson's comment. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I've also really benefited from that, uh, the way the essays follow each other. I think really there is design in Adam Phillips's collection, the way he, he designed that volume. Um, but uh, about Kant, about the first critique. So, as some of you might know, I have, uh, I completed my PhD in cognitive psychology, and there are a lot of superficial similarities between cognitive psychology, psychology concerned with cognition, with cognitive faculties, with, the, with mental capacities, and the way our mental capacities mediate our relationship with the world. Uh, but those, um, the, the, the prejudices and biases of cognitive psychology that are built in to, to, um, to help cognitive psychology as a discipline survive and be independent of other subdisciplines of psychology. Um, those biases of that subdiscipline, cognitive psychology, are so strong and so severe that they promote certain kinds of blindness. And if you really, truly just become a cognitive psychologist, which I almost became, I almost became indoctrinated in um, cognitive, as a cognitive psychologist, uh, I finished a PhD at least. Um, and if that indoctrination is complete, then you will just see no point at all in transcendental idealism of, um, and critical philosophy of Kant. You just say, okay, what is this? What is he doing? Why do we need this empirical realism, transcendental idealism, um, intuition? And then Kant also, uh, he introduces some combination of concepts, for example, intellectual intuition or transcendental realism and dismisses them. So these, these concepts don't, um, they, they, are, they don't refer to anything or they, they are impossible. Um, like, Intellectual intuition is possible only uh, if at all, if, if it, would be, it would be possible for a creature like a God, where thinking brings about an object, a particular object. Um, and transcendental idealism is the fundamental flaw for Kant in the previous philosophies. Um, but, so that was the, my route that I almost missed because of that route, because of being on that path. Uh, of cognitive psychology, I almost missed um, the sensibility that would allow me to appreciate Kant and philosophy, much of philosophy in general. But what I think what saved me was um, psychoanalysis, because psychoanalysis, despite all of its shortcomings, is a much richer way of approaching subject matter. It is, it's just richer. It involves more distinctions. It is not as lazy and it is not strict and um, reductionistic in a way that contemporary cognitive neuroscience is. I'm thinking, for example, of people um, like um, Christoph Koch. Christoph Koch uh, was associated with Francis Crick the you know the, the group the whole group that discovered the the structure of the DNA, and they turned after that work after their research in molecular molecular biology they turned to, of course, the study of consciousness. What else? It's funny, isn't it? Funny that it always happens that people from the hard sciences, from the so-called uh, serious sciences, they turn into consciousness. Never from the other direction. I don't know why. Um, it was like Herbert Simon uh, who got the Nobel Prize in economics um, 
I think Herbert Simon won the Nobel Prize in the late 70s, some, some let's say 1979 or 78. Uh, around that time, he started turning to cognitive psychology or cognitive, the cognitive sciences. That was, at the time, kind of new. And he was also interested in uh, discovering, you know, on... Um, taking away the mysteries of genius and creativity and human judgment and saying that all these things are really just basic cognitive processes. So that kind of, that's the, and uh, I mentioned the reason why I brought up Christoph Koch was because he has a book called um, Confessions of a Romantic Reductionist. How that, just the title of that book annoys the hell out of me. <clears throat> I can't even read the title and not be annoyed. Um, and I'm familiar, I've read some articles by Koch and his colleagues. It's all about, oh, consciousness is not that mysterious. Basically, that's the bottom line. <laughs> it's like, great, congratulations. Um, but that attitude is not really there in psychoanalysis. And I think the, the richness that instead of calling themselves the romantic reductionists, uh, psychoanalysis really, at least the people that we continue to read, Freud, Jung, Lacan, these are the, the, the open paths. They add new dimensions to discourse mm -hmm. rather than trying to forbid and prohibit uh, types of discourse. Mm -hmm. And they bring in, and I think it is because I spent some time with people like Freud and Jung that I can, now it is, uh, the, the appreciation of Kant is to some degree uh, possible for me. And so I would say, I, I would also encourage, if you're interested in getting to Kant, but find him a little bit dry, maybe try coupling Kant with some other thinker like Freud or Jung. Um, because, you know, I, you know, we are, <laughs> we are alive now. I'm, I've survived COVID, it's 2022. I want to read Kant as a hedonist. <laughs> I mean that only half jokingly. I want to read philosophy hedonistically this year. When I take a book like this and show it in front of a camera, I'm not um, kind of, I'm not trying to, virtue signal or intellectual intellectually virtue signal or something like that. No, I'm just uh, sharing with you my hedonistic uh, plans for 2022. And if I, if my hedonism runs out um, halfway through the book, I will try to find it. And if I can't find it, then I'll put, put Kant aside for a while. Um, but there are tricks, I believe, you know, I've read now, I've read enough to know that sometimes bringing back pleasure to a reading involves going back and forth and finding a pairing, you know, a pairing that works. Um, anyways, now we have covered 19 books, unless I'm mistaken. Uh, the th last three books are... Uh, Inventing the Enemy by Umberto Eco, which uh, with our reading group, we are going to spend six months reading these collections, these collections of essays. Um, I said that wrong. This collection of essays by Umberto Eco, which is titled Inventing the Enemy. So we are going to read one essay at a time. And I've, uh, you can check the link in the descriptions of the video for the online events. Um, I've, I've distributed the essays over the six months. There are only two sessions in which we read two essays uh, for each of those one sessions. Uh, otherwise, and those are because those, two essay, uh, those four essays are relatively short and doing that was possible. Otherwise, uh, we spent each session discussing one essay and I really look forward to to those discussions and spending time with Echo and his, his occasional 
uh, occasional writings. That's the subtitle of the, the book, Inventing the Enemy and Other Occasional Writings. The last two books are um, recent publications, which I've read a lot of positive things about. One of them is called This Life, Secular Faith and Spiritual Freedom by Martin Haglund. Um, and I've read one chapter of this book, and I liked it. Um, he, he almost lost me in the first half of chapter one, but then um, I managed to connect with the book and I really liked it. Um, and finally, The Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity by David Graeber and David Vengro. This is also a book that I've read a couple of chapters of and looking forward to continuing um, the Inside Seminar, uh, Inside Seminar organization has currently um, a reading group devoted to the dawn of everything. Um, I believe they just covered the third chapter, and those are really fun uh, meetings if you like to join a book club. It's, I think, the one that I joined, the one session that I joined for that book, uh, there were about 20 people. And the, the way it is organized, each session is led by one of the, each, each, each session is led by a different member. And it's quite good. That also is a, is, is a very positive feature. All right. Um, so these are our 22. As I was going through, to be honest, as I was going through this list and showing you the books, there were so many other books that came to my mind. I was like, damn, I should have included that one too. There's some books that I would like to reread um, because a lot was happening in my life last year, 2021. Uh, because a lot was happening, some of the books that I read last year, I felt like I was not attentive enough while I was reading them. One such book is uh, the book by Wolfram. Um, I, I, what's his name? Um, Wolfram Eilenberger. Um, Time of the Magician. So I've read this book once, enjoyed it, uh, but my attention, I think, wasn't fully engaged with the book while I was reading it. Lots of other life issues in the periphery in my mind, on my mind. And the book itself has a kind of scattered organization. Uh, it's almost like every two, three pages, uh, sometimes every page, we jump from um, one life to another life because the, the author is covering the lives of four different in thinkers, intellectuals, philosophers. And these four different people have, you know, they have different lives. They are, they're not spending time together. They're, they, they might have like two characters might have a um, very brief encounter, but they are different narratives, four different narratives. And the author, Eilenberger, uh, jumps very quickly between these these narrative lines, and that was another reason. Not the only reason. It was one, another reason that I found it a little bit difficult to to stay engaged with that book. Um, but unfortunately, this did not make it to our list. And now that the list is written on stone, um, cannot be changed. So uh, there you go. <laughs> um, I look forward to whatever else might happen um, related to uh, our social media engagement with YouTube. Um, I'm very happy and thankful to have reached and surpassed 1,000 subscribers uh, last year. That was another really great milestone. I hope that I um, continue to produce the kind of content that motivated you to join uh, in the first place. Um, yeah. And I guess that's it. Thank you for watching and Happy New Year again. Um, take care of yourselves and 
uh, if you have books that you think should be added to these lists written on stone, um, if you think some of these books should be replaced, uh, if you have books that you really like to read, um, please share them in the comment section. I'd love to hear about your plans. Otherwise, thanks again and um, till next time.